Hi, today my guest is Don Folk. Don is a management consultant that focuses on strategy, organization, and staffing. Don has more than 50 years of experience in the field, including time as the president and CEO of Hickling Johnson and the managing director at Mercer's. He also served as the chairman of the Global Organization Design Society and founded the New Management Network. Don recently co-authored a book with his wife Bonnie called The Smart Creative, Finding, Developing, and Keeping Leaders for the Digital Age. A quick note before we get started. I'm planning on producing some videos to expand on some of the concepts that come up in today's interview. If there is a specific concept that you want me to cover, let me know in the comments or by email. Also, links to Don's book as well as the organizations he's affiliated with will be in the description. I hope you enjoy. All right, Don, so why don't we start with this. You've had 50 years of experience consulting. What would you say the major themes you've worked on are? Well, when I started uh, in consulting, I was a applied operations research was the stuff I was working on, which really was about inventory control. And uh, the T. Eaton Company was my first big assignment. But um, because of what was going on in the country at the time, I found myself working for provincial governments. Uh, and the, uh, the, the main issue there in the end was organization. And the, the organization problems were about decision making, like uh, who had the power to decide what? Mm -hmm. And how did a cabinet hold individual ministers accountable, basically, so that things got done in a coordinated way across the government? Uh -huh. And then, um, at the time, I was also involved with uh, consulting engineering companies and uh, um, heavy equipment uh, sales companies and uh, a whole range of other companies in different industries. And the issues there were largely strategic in some sense, and that's the way we used to look at organization. And it was uh, how should we set our forces up here so that we can be specialized on some things and cover geographies properly. And uh, uh, so that it was structure was the thing we were, we were concerned about. And um, then what came along is the issue of how do we get these things actually to be implemented? Because I had uh, CEOs say to me, well, you know, I really think you've got the ideas right here. This is what we should be doing. But I don't see how I can fit my people into this. Mm -hmm. because they're so used to operating in a different environment. So the issue became how do, you, how, do you, how do you fit people to the roles that you need to handle structure, structurally in terms of the strategy you were trying to follow. And that, was the, that became the sort of driving thing over the years. It's been the, how do you align strategy and structure and get the right people in the right seats. And so what approaches have you found to be useful for getting that done? Well, um, they used to think that it was all about the experience people had and the particular skills that they had, but that wasn't enough. And uh, we, we came to understand that we really needed to look at executives differently. And there was a period there we were uh, almost stuck on the idea that if you got the right personalities aligned, with the different roles you were trying to fill. For example, where you needed an entrepreneurial creative person, did, did you have that personality alignment? Or where you needed somebody who could really put systems in place, mm -hmm. did you have somebody who had that capability? And uh, so that, there was a focus on that for quite a period of time. But we found that that wasn't enough. And uh, it was in the 90s that we discovered the work of Elliot Jacks. And uh, uh, Jacks had come clearly to see that there were different levels of complexity in the way uh, an organization needed to function. That is, small, simple organizations could, could function with a, a, a rel relatively low level of complexity. Mm -hmm. And um, that there were these natural levels of complexity in an organization that were uh, true across all different kinds of industries. And a matter of fact, Elliot's work took him all around the world and he could see that they were culturally independent too. Mm -hmm. And this was about the ability to handle complexity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this became a, a really key important way that you designed an organization, that you s suddenly went from just trying to deal with the horizontal patterns that you were trying to organize for a company 
but what were the levels of complexity that were involved in each of the different functional areas or geographic areas uh, within the company. And these, it turns out that the levels of complexity on the one hand, structurally in an organization, are exactly the same as the level of capability that people mm -hmm. have. And that, the, so this added another very powerful dimension to how do you fit people to the roles that can handle the strategy is, is that you've got people with the capability to handle complexity that was aligned with the, the requirement of the, of the structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you think uh, Elliot really got right? Because he didn't just have, uh, this was one of his backbones of, of his findings, but he ended up uh, doing a lot of work, as I understand, with the military, uh, the US military, and other organizations to try to figure out um, how to set up a management system and to set up the organization so things actually get done the, the way they're supposed to. So what do you think he got the most, most right, his breakthrough stuff? Well, I think his biggest breakthrough probably was getting the, the levels of work right so that you got work done at the right level. But there were other uh, almost equally important ideas and one of them was that there was a way of, 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 of organizing accountability in the organization so that the manager became accountable for the work of the subordinates. And that that set up the right, right relationship between a manager and his people who were uh, working for him. And that was the key to a trust environment. And then he also had the idea that the manager once removed had the ability and the requirement to look beyond the short run, which a manager does, mm -hmm. to the long run, and particularly to the development of, of uh, the talent in an organization. So this led in, in some sense to Eliot's, um, what I think is probably his most important contribution, mm -hmm. that it, he, he um, outlined the, the curves of development of, of people over time. Mm -hmm. And these are um, based on his uh, statistical work in organizations around the world that there were these patterns these patterns of development that were uh, once again culturally independent that uh, were st statistically accurate that suggested that if a person was at a certain stratum or level in complexity at say age 25 that he would he would have the capability potentially to be at other certain predictable levels down the road, and that it, uh, if, a, if a company, the manager once removed in particular, has his accountability to, to pay attention to this, but in terms of the organization as a whole, thinking ahead as the strategy of the organization uh, would create growth or change, that there would be people who had a very good chance of being in the, at the level of capability that when they were needed at say in 10 or 15 years, that the organization was working to make sure they got the skilled knowledge and experience that they needed to fill those roles when the time came. Mm -hmm. how, how do you see the, the trend today of people bouncing around a lot in um, affecting sort of a talent pool management piece? Because you may have somebody who's a very high mode, is it still worth figuring that out and trying to put a lot of resources into development if they're going to walk out uh, in a few years' time. Well, this is a this is a conundrum, I think, in organizations. And part of the problem is that the the uh, training and development programs are put in place that that have the idea that everybody is essentially created equal, mm -hmm. and so that they're one size fits all very often, mm -hmm. and. So they, by necessity, aim at the sort of average uh, a person, or uh -huh. they, maybe the average manager, who uh, would, uh, starting out as, uh, say, coming out of university, capable at, at stratum two, we would say, and that we would predict by the time he was, say, 30 or 35, he would be capable, perhaps, at stratum three. And so the training and development programs were aimed at uh, providing that development of skilled knowledge and experience. Well, the high flyers, the very high potential uh -huh. people coming out of university very often at stratum three or in some cases even stratum four uh, already 
uh -huh. would be so bored by the by the training programs and so um, uh, stultified by the lack of uh, of um, coaching and uh, teaching and opportunities that they needed to develop themselves within the company would say enough of this I'm off I'm going to find my own way from place to place to place and the bottom line very often is that the company lo loses their very high priority people mm -hmm. now Bonnie and I produced this book here uh, earlier this year and it's about the smart creatives these mm -hmm. are people who are uh, we would say capable of being at a general management level or higher during their career uh -huh. so that they're they're not they're more than capable of, of being front line managers or or being middle managers but they're capable of being general managers or business unit heads or executive vice presidents in international corporations and CEOs and CEOs of very large companies that these are the the smart creatives yeah and that you really need not only do you need to cater to them uniquely you need to provide them with the development opportunities the coaching the uh, the uh, job assignments and so on and the ability to relate to the their peers not just at a certain level but in the, the same developmental path uh -huh. so that you get um, you, you get them engaged and you get them uh, developing along the path they should be on and it's not just one path for them but the person who's going to be able to be only a general manager has different kinds of development path and needs than the person who c has the capability of being a CEO down the road mm -hmm. now it's not a hundred percent accurate because these aren't predictions but the idea these are probable paths of, of potential and the developmental efforts should be tailored to make sure that the developmental opportunities learning skills um, uh, arrive in time for a person to realize that capability this mm -hmm. is the big challenge for the modern company uh -huh. and if they get it right boy this is a tremendous uh -huh. competitive advantage yeah one question you would have is um, in the the canonical teaching of the theory is is that somebody at level two say with a different mode or potential than somebody who's at stratum two and they're going to stay at stratum two the rest of their career is somebody who's just come out of university even though they're operating at the same level is it, does that person look and feel different do they do their job differently even though they're at the same level now it's the the age and the the future potential does that affect how they look and feel and sound yes i believe it does and i think i think uh, what we're, t we're talking about here is a difference in mode mm -hmm. and mode is the developmental path uh, in elliot's definition it's the stratum that you have the potential of being capable of at age 70 mm -hmm. and he saw, thought that was you know probably five or maybe even 10 years beyond the retirement age uh -huh. Today we would say that's almost mid-career for yeah. high-level high people. And so um, the point here is that I think I kind of lost my point there. Well, do they look and feel different even if do they're they the same? Do they look and feel different? Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. And uh, experienced managers know this because a, a high-mode experienced manager can tell just by the way the young person uh, looks and acts and the questions he has and the needs he has for uh, uh, talking and the things where his interests are in terms of the complexity of the of the models you might say that he's trying to develop in his own mind and uh, the person who's at a low mode is is uh, satisfied with simpler explanations uh -huh. whereas the person at a high mode um, well, he can't work with these highly complex models at a young age. He he has a sense or a feel of them, and he 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 reaches for knowledge that'll help him fill them out. And if he isn't working, um, or mentored by, or coached by 
a, a person in a similar mode, he will be very, he'll be very frustrated and will find that he just isn't on the path that he needs to be on. And, and you would almost say that the mode is, in a sense, the amount of intellectual curiosity or, or ambition, or it's, it's not necessarily the same as that, but it, it, those uh, traits would likely accompany somebody, at least on, um, they're intellectually curious and ambitious at trying to figure things out. Is, yes, that's that, right. Yeah. I think that's, a, there, there are a number of key to, keys to it. I remember Elliot used to say, well, you can tell by looking in their eyes, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there's, there's a certain truth to that, I mm -hmm. think. But um, it's, uh, I mean, there, the, the high mode is the technical uh, description of it. But, but what, what it really is, is the, is the inherent horsepower of the individual. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably a pretty good way of thinking about it. So could, could you explain more how um, somebody like Owen Jacobs, who is familiar with this type of work, would, would explain the horsepower behind this? I'm not sure I could do justice to uh, to uh, Owen's work, and and it's worth noting that Owen worked with Elliot, and they were both working for the U.S. Army, and the U.S. Army's question was, which of our colonels in the Army have the potential to become general officers? Is there a way we can uh, we can identify the ones who do have that potential? And uh, they work together, and this is where um, real clarity to some of these ideas came. And um, Owen ha has uh, helped us identify a number of mode markers, he calls. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and we do have a list of them in the book here, uh, the th sort of things that you look for, or uh, ways of identifying high mode. And mm -hmm. there are some... There are some distinctions, for example, between people who we think are probably f mode five or four, and now we're both, both of those are high potential people, and the people who are potentially capable at, at uh, mode six, stratum six or higher in, in their mm -hmm. careers, that the, the um, fours and fives tend to be extrapolative thinkers. They tend to take the current frame of knowledge or models that they have and project them. Mm -hmm. Whereas this, the mode five and six, I'm sorry, the mode six and sevens um, very often are reaching right outside the current models, right outside the current way of thinking of things and, and synthesizing and integrating them um, into uh, truly breakthrough ideas. Mm -hmm. And so for somebody not familiar with the curves, what, what are, how many stratum are there commonly and what type of a company would be at what complexity? Well, we, we think that by and large the Canadian banks are at stratum six. Uh, mm -hmm. What that means is that the, the CEO of the Canadian banks is probably a stratum six capable person. Um, uh, Jack Welch, when he was head of uh, General Electric, was thought to be a stratum eight capable person. And um, I think that there are, have been uh, Canadian bankers that who are, uh, have been clearly stratum seven. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, a, t a typical mid-sized company is a stratum five led company. Mm -hmm. And that there are often uh, companies that are quite capably operated at stratum four. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these become pulled together in a conglomerate type structure where the, the conception is at stratum five or maybe even six. Mm -hmm. So um, getting into the book, you talk about uh, the label is smart creative and I, could you say where that came from? Well, this was a Google phrase uh -huh. as far as I know. And uh, uh, in Silicon Valley, they say, well, this is what we're really looking for as a smart creative. Uh -huh. And it's part, part of the, th the thing that's put the lights on there in everybody's mind is, and I think Steve Jobs was the one who articulated this really clearly, that a New York, t in the New York taxi driver population, somebody who's twice as good as the next taxi driver, really, uh, that's probably all you can expect. 
But if you take a programmer, um, they can be a thousand times as good as the average. Uh -huh. And, and the, the, the leverage from smarts is, is enormous. Yeah. And so the attention is on smart creative here. And so what, um, so this, this came from Google and really what you're talking about here is the level of complexity that someone can deal with and it's not necessarily uh, creative in a personality or, or like a specific creative ability. You're, you're saying that if they're able to handle this complexity then they're able to play around creatively in a sense because they can um, handle more complex work which to the outside eye might look like creativity. It's uh, yes, I think that's true, although I think it's probably true that the very high mode people are in fact huh. more creative and I don't know how this really plays out in the artistic world. I, mean, yeah. I just don't know enough uh -huh. about that. Well, and it would make sense the, from my understanding of big five personality stuff, the, the trait openness which is associated with creativity is also highly associated with, with intelligence, which IQ, I would assume, is highly correlated with the levels of complexity that you can deal with. Uh, you we're talking about a similar thing. I, I'm told that the the overall uh, uh, correlations aren't really that good. Mm. B but if you look inside what IQ is measuring, there are aspects of IQ that uh, are highly correlated with uh, the ability to handle complexity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So in the book you talk about development being the key critical variable that um, can, I want to read the exact quote, it, development is the critical variable in attracting and retaining the smart creative. So are you proposing here that if a company can set up um, the right structure and, and get the right things to happen, that uh, smart creative is more likely to stick around and, and find it engaging at work? Is it yes, like that's the idea. Uh -huh. and it, you, that if you have a, if you have a good sense of a person's mood, and you you bring them in in their um, a, a stratum three capable person, that you can identify when in their career, like two or three or four years down the road, that they will be likely to go through this trans transformation. Really, in some sense, is, is what it is, into stratum, into stratum four capability, where they have the mental horsepower. Mm -hmm to handle a general management job. Of course, they're just young people and they don't have the experience. So what you need to do, uh, every w chance you get with a person like that is make sure that they're getting the skilled knowledge and experience so that they can realize that transition, realize mm -hmm. that potential. Yeah. And if you don't do that for them, they'll go somewhere else and find it. And, and so what I'm hearing there, and it's expressed in the book to some degree, is the idea that you can predict sort of their um, progressions along these curves, but when they get there, they need to be able to have a s synchronization of other things in, in place. So one of them there is the skills, knowledge, and experience, but do you have other things that you think you need to get right? Well, I think that, I think emotional, social development is a really, really key part of this. Mm -hmm. And this may be uh, particularly true of the technical people uh, engineers in Silicon Valley who, who are not as a naturally adept mm -hmm. with, in social intelligence. And so that you need to make sure that they have the kind of exposure that gives them more um, personal self-awareness and therefore o ability to be aware of the other so that they, and so that they learn how to um, uh, coach and develop people who are uh, uh, accountable to them in a managerial yeah. hierarchy. I had a client where uh, the office manager, which was a stratum four role, uh -huh. and he was, a, he was a very, very bright engineer, very bright engineer, and he was having a very difficult time with his, his people and one of the anecdotes I heard of the, a, a young engineer going in to see him about a problem he had, which was a personal problem and a professional problem. And the, the boss sat with his back to him, looking at his computer the whole time the conversation was on. 
Well, this is a perfect example of the, per of the man with the, with the horsepower to do the work, uh -huh. but he, but he didn't, hadn't learned the empathy or the skills to deal, to bring along another person or to relate properly to another person. Uh -huh. And when that was brought to his attention and he was given some opportunity to learn some of that, he's turned out to be one of their more successful executives. Hmm. Interesting. So what are some, you talked a little bit about this, but what are some specific things that a company can put in place to help uh, facilitate this development and, and keep the smart creatives interested in developing? One of the things that, that needs to happen here is, uh, is an, identify, uh, uh, an identification of the, of the mode, of the capability, of the interests, and of uh, the skilled knowledge and experience of each individual in terms of a profile. This needs to be developed for three reasons. The manager needs it to know how to work with the person mm -hmm. and to, to see that he gets what he can get in a certain role that he's currently in. The manager once removed, that is the boss's boss, mm -hmm. needs to see that profile so that he can see what the longer term developmental needs are likely to be and he can say to the manager, I know you're re relying on this young man or young woman but she needs now to d have this and I know it's going to cause you problems but we need to engineer this move for her. Uh -huh. And, and uh, uh, the company needs the, the map of all of these people mm -hmm. overall so that they got a sense of, well, you know, it looks like in 10 years we're going to be all right, but in the next five, we're going to be short of people who can work in this area at, at Stratum 4. Uh -huh. And then uh, lastly, in some ways, most importantly, the individual needs the feedback. Mm -hmm. My own experience has been when you, when you give them feedback on their capability, you give them feedback on the personal, personality style that they're comfortable with and mm -hmm. the tool that Bonnie and I use for this is the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. And if you give them feedback on their their uh, preferred managerial capabilities in the easy sense of the producer, the administrator, the entrepreneur, the integrator, what's their preferred profile? Once you give a, uh, an individual this feedback <coughs> and say, here's your potential capability, uh -huh. the person says, gee, I, I hadn't realized what I was capable of here. Mm -hmm. And I can see what I need to do to move myself along this path. Uh -huh. It's a, it's an, in, almost an inspiration in a sense of. That's been my experience yeah. with it. it uh, there are cases you run into where people uh, don't don't understand that uh, that they're not as capable as they think they are. But that's very rare. Uh, my experience is most people say, "I hadn't realized I mm -hmm. had this upside. I better get at it." Uh huh. Uh huh. And so. Back to the theme that we have of high turnover, especially of the smart creatives who are getting frustrated at work and not feeling that they're getting engaged enough and so they move on to another opportunity. If it's, if, since most companies aren't aware of this and aren't implementing or focusing on a development strategy for their high potential people, what can somebody do to facilitate their own development if they're moving from company to company or if they're an entrepreneur or, or if they're what can they do uh, in, if they can't rely on a company to help them? Well, it's good to have this self-knowledge on all these fronts mm -hmm. and to look at the things that are uh, helpful for filling in the gaps and um, for sometimes a young man or a young woman sees that they have the potential to become a general manager, say, in their mid-30s, uh, realize that they, you know, while they're expert in their field, they really don't know very much about finance mm -hmm. or about accounting. Yeah. And that <clears throat> maybe if they just took some night courses at the local university, this would give them an inside track on what they're going to need to do to be able to balance once they get into a general management role. Mm. So the the point here really I think is that it's not it's not incumbent upon the company to 
-hmm. lay it out for the individual. Uh -huh. It's important upon, it's important for the individual to grab a hold of their own career. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're a, a person right now who's maybe in their 20s or 30s or 40s and they're looking ahead and you, you're hearing about needing to have the self-knowledge, how do you, how would somebody go about finding out? Well, um, there are people like me and I have colleagues who, who will do these kinds of, se of assessments and we do them for companies and we do them in, on occasion for individuals. So uh -huh. get as much self-knowledge on all these fronts as you can, I would say. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been thinking about maybe opening a uh, sort of career coaching or, or some sort of an assessment for people if that would be interesting. I mean, I think you'd be interested in that too. But. Well, I, I think this is right. and. Um, there, there are uh, facilities out there that uh, offer career coaching, and I think it's all good stuff, but there are, there are almost none who've got their finger on this complexity, le the, le the stratum, uh, the different strata of complexity and the, the developmental paths. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the, the farther that this can get be, be spread in terms of the servicing community, the better off it'll be for everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and to me, it sort of sounds like when you're talking about development, a lot of this is really about awareness in, in the sense. And so these are all areas that you need to be aware of. But, you know, when you get to the emotional social issues, it's about um, an awareness of your effect on other people and an awareness in, in a way to build a psychological maturity, so to speak. And so it's really the most powerful weapon you have is just be, becoming aware of these things. I would say that's right. Uh -huh. and the Enneagram, which I mentioned, is very powerful for this. And I, my, my own experience is I, I found out by attending a very long program years ago at the Esalen Institute that I was an Enneagram 5. And, uh, you know, uh, the, our teacher, who was Helen Palmer, uh, couldn't find a full panel of fives because <laughs> most of them wouldn't appear in public. But my, my reaction to it was, well, isn't that the way everybody is? I had you the know? same reaction. <laughs> you, know, you know, well, if they aren't, they damn well should be. It's some, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. some weakness on their part. And then it was an eye-opener for me to see that there were, you know, eight other styles who saw the world extremely differently than I did. So that, so that as I learned about them, I could see the, how it was important to relate to them differently and how in a collaborative group or a management team, uh, different people were, were able to play different roles much more strongly mm -hmm. if you, if you uh, acknowledged that in your own mind at least. So this was all an opening of self-awareness for me and I, it was a very important mm -hmm. piece of development for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna shift gears a, l a little and go back to Elliot's stuff here. And you were talking about a lot of the stuff you really got right. Do you think there's stuff that he maybe missed out on or, or either was wrong on or is missing that would help add to the, the work he was doing? Well, I think we've just been talking about some of that. Elliot didn't think much of personality study. Mm -hmm. he, he, th he thought that that really wasn't important. It, he thought that it was an invasion of privacy, basically, not the company's business uh -huh. to know. But, um, those of us working in the field, I think, have realized that he had a blind spot there, and uh, that that was one one thing. Um, I, I w another thing I would say is that as he looked at organizations, and he he was his, he was focused on the vertical dimension, yeah. that is the accountability yeah. lines in a vertical way, and we we would ask him about, you know different business units and so on, and he would say, oh, that's strategy, that's not, uh -huh. that's not my purview. And I think that the, the, the melding of strategy and his knowledge is very powerful. Uh, for example, I've been working with a company over the years, um, uh, along with a client by the name of, or a, a colleague by the name of Julian Fairfield from Australia, mm -hmm. where the, 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 development and deployment of levels of capability were key strategic levers. Mm -hmm. They were focused basically on a capability that was led at stratum three 
and the opportunities in the market had, had a, a requirement of stratum four or stratum five in terms of the key roles. And, the, and they didn't have the capability to do it. And a lot of the competition didn't. And they could see that uh, if they could develop that capability inside their company, they could take advantage of the opportunity strategically. And so there's a perfect example of how uh, the one uh, Elliot's narrower focus really could benefit from a broader view. I think at one time you you told me an example that was um, the Japanese car manufacturing and the, the total quality control. That, I that don't right? think that was or me was it, that was telling you was about it, that. I thought somebody was saying they brought that up to five. I, I, it's not a case I'm hmm. familiar with. So one of the other trends we're seeing right now in society is automation and artificial intelligence. and. Can you, can you talk about how that might affect some of the work that Elliot did and how that might affect businesses moving forward sort of um, with this knowledge? Well, uh, there's a couple of things that come to mind on that. Um, there's a lot of hand wringing these days about how uh, automation and artificial intelligence are gonna displace uh, people. Mm -hmm. And you know, what are we gonna do uh, with all of these people in jobs basically at stratum one and two. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the, when you look at what's happened here, and there's a thing called the, the Flynn effect, mm -hmm. which shows that IQ, and he, his research is all in IQ, um, uh, has gone up by 3% per decade throughout the whole of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. and, what the, and, what this, and what we're dealing with here is a, is a bell curve. And what's really happened with, and it's, it's uh, probably a combination of what's happened in families mm -hmm. and what's happened in so socially, that the level of capability in Eliot's terms, mm -hmm. in terms of the ability to handle complexity, has gone up in the whole population. And uh, uh, the, this these bell cur curves have shifted to a higher level. So, you know, when you look at what that actually means today, and over the next, say, 20, 10 or 20 years, we're gonna have far fewer people in the population who are st capable of stratum, at stratum one, from something like, say, a third of the population to something like 10% of the population. Mm -hmm. that, and uh, w what's happening to the curve is that we've got far more people capable at stratum three than we used to have, which really means that everybody's brighter mm -hmm. and that there's a capability much higher to use the mental capacity of the population to get stuff done than we ever had. And just because we aren't going to be able to uh, 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 find jobs for, for, for all the people who traditionally would have been truck drivers. Mm -hmm. That's not true for the next generation. Mm -hmm. So this, this is coming from the last chapter in your book. It's called the talent upshift. Do you want to talk about the rest of the, the other half of that puzzle? Well, the other half of the puzzle is, <laughs> which is, goes back to what I was saying at the outset here, where um, Elliot talked about mode as what, what happens when you got to be... Um, 70 years old. Well, the thing is, when you project Elliot's curves from, say, 70 years old to 80 or 90 years old, mm -hmm. what you start to see is that there's a tremendously larger number of very bright people. Mm -hmm. And a, and a and very large... <laughs> and experienced. And a very large number of really bright people mm -hmm. and quite bright people mm -hmm. because these curves continue to rise after age 70. Mm -hmm. And the idea that the society should be retiring these people at age 65 is nonsense. We, the, it's not good for the people, it's not good for the society. And uh, there's a tremendous capacity emerging for, for old people who, who um, uh, want to work, are smarter than they ever have been, and have uh, skilled knowledge and experience that nobody else has got. And it means we can get a hell of a lot more done it, uh, in the society than we used to. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, and, and since the, the world's more of a knowledge economy that, you know, you're not going to wear yourself out, out as you get older. Well, so, that's yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. And oh. now, you know, it's not for everybody. And if people have health problems, uh, it may mean that they, they can't uh, participate in the same way. And there are uh, certain jobs, certain roles in the construction industry, for example, you really can't physically do after, say, age 60 even. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that what they know and their ability uh -huh. to handle complexity can't be applied elsewhere. Uh -huh. And um, there, th I think we're on the verge here of a very important shift in the flexibility of the population, the Western population, the skilled populations like Canada and the United States and the UK to uh, uh, fuel economic growth, even though we have declining uh, population uh -huh. numbers, or, you know, uh, population growth numbers. We, we've got tremendous growth in smarts. And I'm not talking just about the computers there, I'm talking about the people uh -huh. who can work with them. And so this strikes me as a very uh, optimistic uh, idea. And so can you use that to give me a case for why we should be optimistic about the future? Well, <clears throat> it seems to me, you know, that you go back over economic history every time there's a, a, there's a big shift um, there's a, a whole lot of people like they used to call the Luddites who mm -hmm. didn't want to have the technology. It's not to say that it's easy for everybody to make the adjustments. And it's unrealistic to, be, to expect people, older people who are trained in a certain way to do something completely different. It's unrealistic. But overall, the population uh, has the ability to uh, shift into another capability to take on uh, uh, challenges that we need to taking taking on. I, I think that the fact that the, the, there's tr so much um, personal employment in the economy mm -hmm. is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, the, that the idea that there's so much um, movement from place to place and job to job is, is a way of this younger, more capable population actually building its own skill, knowledge, and experience and uh, um, emotional and social capability base. And that this will coalesce in, in maybe not as quite a rigid way as it has in the 20th century corporate structures, uh -huh. but the ability for networks to actually get stuff done that, they, that you couldn't get done before. A lot of this you can see on the, on the web companies, you know. Uh -huh. I mean, take a Airbnb or, or Uber, they're examples of it. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, th there's, just a there's just a capability technically to support this in gr in growing capability uh, personally. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to, because um, when I was hearing you talk there, I was thinking about those people who would be working sort of personally, um, maybe in a one-person company or in a small team doing um, specific services or whatever. Um, for people like that who are high mode or smart creatives, can you speak to the importance of um, mode peers and how that might, uh, how people sort of, you know, are looking for that type of contact and why and, and how that can be useful for development? Well, I think, uh, I think you got your finger on a really important idea, which is, is mode peers. And by that, um, I would understand it to be a, a group of um, people who are at different ages, and by, uh, but, at, but in the same mode, say, mm -hmm. in mode five or mode six. And uh, uh, because, because they speak the same language in mm -hmm. some fundamental intellectual sense, they can exchange information across the generations in some mm -hmm. way here. Mm -hmm. You know, a group of people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, all in the same mode, mm -hmm. and that, that ways will be found for those networks to work uh -huh. uh, that will be tremendously powerful in terms of uh, helping the development of each other mm -hmm. at all levels. Well, and just when you're 
speaking, uh, what, what comes to mind a little bit is the friendship that developed between Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, and different age, but both extremely bright. And it, it's a, uh, it's a mentorship, but it's uh, it's it's more of a more of a two-way street on this. Sort it of is a two-way mm -hmm. street. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, and especially at a time where. Um, the younger people in the population are on top of the technology. Mm -hmm. And the older people, I mean, we were looking at my slide rule earlier tonight. Yeah. You know, the older people don't have the same feel for the technology. Mm -hmm. And that um, the one can help the other both ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to shift gears here again. And, and I want you to talk about, you've had a lot of experience in consulting. And, and to you, what is what is a, what makes a good management consultant, and why why should they be considered f uh, for a company? Like, what what's the usefulness of them? Huh. <laughs> oh well, my experience with it has been that um, the insiders running a company need access to innovative thinking and uh, objectivity from those of us who are working across the economy. Mm -hmm. some, some of us in, an, in, a, in particular industries all over the world, uh -huh. specialists in mining, say, or specialists in automotive, but some of us who, who are focused, say, on a functional area like organization and strategy and aligning people, like I am, who are working in all different kinds of companies, we bring a, we bring a different viewpoint we bring uh, an ability to engage the internal people in a way that makes makes change happen, and we uh, we're a great source of fresh ideas in the fields that, as professionals, we stay on top of. Uh huh. And the other thing I'd say there is that when you have somebody from the outside coming in, especially with not only the ability to bring things across industries, but uh, a theoretical and Deep, uh, deep level of experience that you can um, bring things to awareness that other people just aren't aware of and that that alone is a, a very useful thing. I think that's really, uh, that's really a key. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Yeah. So I just got a couple more questions here on a couple topics to end a little fun. One of them is, uh, I'm not sure exactly who the audience is for this, but what would you say to somebody who's starting out and is quite young? What are the two books that you'd you'd recommend reading? Huh. Well, they could start with this one, <laughs> <laughs> but um, hmm, I don't know whether I'd have a good answer to that. I I read a lot of books, and I guess my um, my uh, sense would be to pick something. Um, in the area of particular interest and to um, not stick with a single book but read uh, historically over mm -hmm. a period of years and to see how say you were mentioning at management consulting for example if you were interested in management consulting and uh, its uh, role in the in the economy uh, there's a very good book about uh, The Firm is the name of the book, and it's about the McKinsey organization, mm -hmm. which uh, over a hundred years has been the world's preeminent management consulting firm. Okay. And on a, in a similar um, type of question, what, what have you found is the thing that if you were to go back and you were starting as a consultant again, what, what's the one thing you wish you really knew? the biggest thing you've learned over your, your the career? The biggest thing I've learned. I, I would say the biggest thing I, I've learned is the importance of, uh, of uh, new learning. That is not, not to get stuck in a, in a way of looking at things. Um, and to um, always be trying to roll back the the uh, the frontier in the area that you're uh, pursuing, and probably that the really uh, thing key thing that differentiates you from differentiates you from the rest of the people is 
is your is your ability to stay ahead of the of uh, what's happening in the world in a way that can be that you can help a, a, a client get done what he or she is trying to get done mm -hmm. and so just at the end here I want to find a, I want to give you a chance to show where people can find you and one of the things you've started is the new management network Can you just talk a little about that well um, sure I, I, I've been with a lot of different companies over the years I was uh, the chairman of Hickling Johnson for some time which was a quite a creative Canadian management consulting company I was with the Mercer organization which is a global firm and uh, when I left Mercer's uh, Bonnie and I started uh, uh, our own partnership as a consulting practice. And um, it didn't take us long to understand about the loneliness of private practice. I mean, there's a, there's a great benefit to the firms and the, uh, the, the collegialship and the knowledge that's, that works inside these firms. So we started a group called the New Management Network. It's been going now for I guess uh, about 25 years and uh, we have about 30 members globally mm -hmm. and uh, we people have come and gone over the years and it started out as a, a, a way we could keep our professional development up to date and so we were having one or two uh, workshops a year face to face and then lots as the electronics has gotten better lots of communication otherwise and then over the years we found that while we're private practitioners in some sense that we've been able to form up uh, quite powerful groups small groups to take on quite complex work for clients in a lot of different places and a lot of different industries mm -hmm. and uh, it's been a way of in some sense simulating the firm uh, but but maintaining the, the, the freedom of individual private practice, which it really has a, uh, advantages too. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's been very satisfying to us. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to finish off, where can somebody get the book and uh, how can they get in contact with you? The thing to do is to go to Amazon and put in Don Folk, that's F-O-W-K-E, or Bonnie Folk, uh, who's my co-author here and search on that it's available on Amazon in hard copy and in Kindle and uh, uh, the Kindle you can get like that and the hard copy takes a couple of days <laughs> well thanks Don Been thank a pleasure. you very thank much you. Joshua